This is The Michael Bryan Show. Hi everyone, welcome to the show and today I am joined with Jordan Wilkes who is the founder of Stride which is a sustainable and ethical fashion and clothing brand. Jordan, thanks for being a guest on the show. Uh, My pleasure Michael, looking forward to having a good chat with you. Before we dive into any of the other questions about like sustainable fashion and and your mission for Stride, I noticed you have a dog as a CEO. Would you be able to share the story behind that? Yeah, of course, mate. Um, I'm I'm a huge dog lover. Um, So my whole life I've grown up with dogs. And when I was, you know, starting the business um, from home, um, my dog at the time, he was an inside dog. So I was with him all the time. Um, and because I'm, I'm a solo pre I'm a solo founder, I had really nobody else to, to bounce ideas off. Um, so in a way, him always being next to me was like sort of my right hand man. Um, so I thought it'd be sort of a, a cheeky initiative to make him the CEO. And a few times on our socials and and whatnot, I've, I've proclaimed that you know my dog Mo, he sadly passed away, um, but he's uh, our, our official CEO. Um, so. I just thought a little bit different, you know, sometimes businesses can be a little bit too serious about things and, you know, they have official CEOs and CTOs and whatnot, all these C-suite executives, but I thought, why not, let's, put, let's get a canine uh, CEO to, yeah. to start start the job right. <coughs> it's a shame he's passed away, to be fair, because I was about to ask him what his responsibilities were. Okay, yeah, um, well, for what it's worth, um, you know, not, not long after I rescued another dog, now she's the, the CEO, she's uh, t- taken over that role, um, and I th- think from memory because i did i do this pretty cool thing uh with strider called dogs of stride so a few of the customers i'll send in photos of their dogs and um tell the story behind theirs and they give themselves certain jobs so i believe um one of one of the customers she that she sent in um photo of her dog and he was the chief food officer um so you know he, he loves his food so he was in charge of that um one of another customer sent in another dog it was her jack russell and, and Apparently, this Jack Russell's big love sponge. She was, she was the chief love officer. Um, no. And I think, what was my, my, my kind dog? I um, can't remember what hers was. She, she had another C suite um, ridiculous job. Um, just to, because I feel as like though with my clientele being very conscious, consciously minded, and a lot of them are vegans, um, in that, you know, they, they do appreciate animals in the world. And I think most people um, are dog lovers. So, why not put dogs to the forefront of the business? Yeah, it was just something really interesting about it because a lot of business owners do have like a team or pets and those kinds of things. And um, every now and again, they're like VAs, right? Yeah. Or assistant. It was a bit uh, a bit surprising, I suppose, for want of a better word, yeah. whereby he's this he or she now. Yeah. He is this he. You got a top job. Oh, that's. Yeah, yeah, top top dog, yeah. definitely top dog. Yeah. <laughs> so you you mentioned like sustainable fashion, and I know one of your one of your missions is to take sustainable out of it and make everything sustainable, so that it is normal. Yeah, correct. So that that kind of the aim is to not have a separate category. Yeah, yeah. But to make all fashion sustainable. So one of the things that sort of keep my interest with it was how much of a difference does it make to go from how can I put it I don't want to say other brands because it yeah. makes them sound really bad yeah but to go from a typical fashion brand yep and using a sustainable one so someone goes into a shop buys a t-shirt that's sustainable mm-hmm. how much of a difference does that make because very often in individuals they have this subconscious thing of well how much of a difference does it actually make yeah so could you share a bit about that for us yeah for sure and just to touch on your first point michael about um you know wanting sustainable fashion way to crash or slow fashion just to be the norm uh reason being is that when it's a subset it's it's a separate part of what the core what the core industries of fashion so if we just say if sustainable fashion separate to normal fashion then anything that's not sustainable fashion is unsustainable fashion so the end goal is is to make that the norm so sustainable and ethical practice is what is part and parcel of the fashion industry not just this subset that five percent of brands do so 
that's a long-term aim and looks something that I, I can't achieve myself. But there's a lot of um, great brands out there, a lot of uh, really smart consumers who are demanding better. So optimistically, I, I'd like to think this would happen in maybe 20 years. Um, I think it would be a generational thing. But you can go on back to the crux of the, the second part of the question. Um, what difference can an individual make? Um, that The person who's a bit sceptical and saying, like, what can I do? I'm just one person. You know, theoretically, they are correct. They, they are one person. But a saying that I like to share with Stride and I like to share with, with in my circles is that small changes times millions of people equals a global impact. Um, so a, a classic example is Greta Thunberg, who I believe three years ago, um, uh, what's the word, protested outside Swedish parliament demanding action on climate change. Um, and then a couple of years later, she mobilised global protests around the world, which I think totaled about 45 million people. So if this 15-year-old schoolgirl in Sweden can protest outside of parliament and, and really change the world, because I think most people in the world know who she is. If she can do that, um, then what? why can't you, the next time you go shopping, choose to buy something that's made from organic cotton as opposed to non-organic cotton? Um, and I really feel as though that you don't need to be a perfect consumer. So for the person who feels, feels, uh, who feels as though they can't make a change just themselves, it's not that you need to be a zero waste consumer tomorrow. It's what steps can you take, you know, tomorrow, next week, next month, and over the next year to make small changes to make your consumption more conscious, um, you know, have less impact on our environment. Um, yes, I, I just think it's all about just shopping better, not perfect. So it's almost like those little those little tweaks that you can make mm. to I mean, a little difference, I guess, in, in your own world. Yeah, you know? exactly. Do people have a sense of that? Because what I found is there are a lot of other brands out there that just say sourced with, uh, I don't know, whether it's recyclable yep. or sustainable materials. Yep. That tends to be as far as it goes. Yep. So in my mind, I, yeah. I have more information than most, yep. thanks to people like yourself. So I know what that means. Yep. But, you know, Doris from down the road yep. will look at that and go, well, they might, they might look at the price tag, it might be more expensive. Yep. Or they might get a weird look as they walk out the shop mm. or or whatever the case is. Yep. So it seems to me like... There's a bit of a barrier between, yeah, people get it, but then if someone's a little bit on the naive side, it's not translated as well. Yeah, correct. Is that something that, is that, something that you're changing with with, with Stride? Yeah, that, that's definitely what I want to try to do. And I think at the end of the day, an empowered consumer is a good consumer. Um, so not all brands are going to be as transparent as they should be and some because maybe they just haven't thought to include what it's made out of, where it's made and what in the product description. Other brands may be trying to hide something, hence they don't include it. But I think it's really important for customers who, um, you know, who want to learn more about their favorite brands, where they're made, what they're made from, to simply email them and ask them. So I'd highly recommend a resource from Fashion Revolution. Um, it's the who made my clothes moon or hashtag who made my clothes. Um, and that really focuses on the people making the clothes. So it's more on the ethical fashion side about, you know, are you going to pay a living wage in safe conditions and stuff like that. But what's been quite prominent in the last 18 months, I've noticed is like what's in my clothes is quite a big one now. So people are asking like, you know, what is in their clothes? So it's not good enough anymore just to say cotton. Um, you're going to know what, what it's blended with, you know, if it's organic cotton, if it's got certified um, and there's plenty of materials nowadays, you know, like some really cool sustainable materials that I quite like is hemp and linen. Um, Tensile is really cool. Even with like swimwear products and activewear products as well, um, there's a really cool fabric called um, uh, Econil. Oh, sorry, Econil. I, I can never pronounce properly. The it's an acro. It's it's E C O N Y L. I've heard about eight different pronunciations for it. Some say Econil, some say Econil. You can take your pick. Um, that's a really cool fabric that's made from recycled nylon. So I think fishing that's in carpet, they turn that into really cool active wear and swimwear. Um, so I just think it's really important that if, if you don't know, if you didn't have the answer to the questions, ask the question. And if the brain doesn't get back to you, then I think that shows you that they don't really care about their customers and or they're trying to hide something. Is there anything that's a bit more outrageous that you've come across like you might say oh well um wood can be made to make 
underwear or socks or something? Is there anything that's like pretty outrageous that you've come across? Yeah, one thing that blows my mind probably more than it should is that a really cool leather replacement is made from pineapple leaves, so it's called Pinatex, and that's spelled P-I-N-A-T-E-X for anyone who wants to research that. Um, wow. To be honest, it just blows, like, I know we can do really cool things, how we, we've flown to space and done amazing things as a human race, but that just re- really just baffles me how you can turn pineapple leaves, um, you know, into a, a leather substitute. And look, I've researched how they do that, and, and it's amazing, the process. Um, but I highly recommend anyone out there is, who's probably just heard about this for the first time and thinking, how the hell can you do that? Um, check it out because we can do, you know, we can do some innovative things um, when we put our minds to it. So that's probably one that um, def- definitely strikes me every time I think about it. What's the difference? Have you tried it yourself? Have you been given like leather and pineapple leaves side by side and tested them to figure out what the difference is? Yeah, I've seen them in person. With the Pinatex, it's, it's got a slightly different texture to leather it's probably not as um smooth it, it is still quite smooth but le- leather is just sort of you can effortlessly sort of run your hands so with pinatex has got a bit more of a, a firmer property um but from a visual point of view it, it can look almost identical um you know i think t- i think the natural um color of pinatex is quite, kind of like a, a softy white yellow um but you, you can always always um you know color that as well um but i, I found it to be um, a fantastic substitute would you be able to soften it in the same way? Like with leather, you've got obviously like softeners and you can sort of manipulate leather, can't you, a little bit so that it's a yeah. bit more, more comfortable? Is that the same? I, I believe you can. Um, if I'm being perfectly honest, Mark, well, I'm not a, an expert in, in Pinatex. I've got, I've got a really cool brand on board who um, they specialize in it. Um, but I just don't want to give it any false advice um, just because when it gets really sciencey, um, I'm not uh, th- that intelligent in that in that regard, so uh, I don't. I, I, I believe you can, but um, I'd highly recommend yourself anyone listening who wants to learn a bit more, maybe just to do a quick Google search because uh, Mr. Google knows more than I do. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, I, I completely understand. I, I think it's it's just interesting because leather is quite popular as well. It yeah, occurred to me that wouldn't it be cool if that could be made more well known, and I know people buy leather and. Sure that's quite tough you know tough yep. to wear and obviously you sort of wear it in similar to shoes right you wear them in yeah and they get yep. more comfortable if it was the same sort of principle then i, I reckon okay. listening would be a bit more like oh i'll give that a go especially if i can actually manipulate it and make it a bit easier to to get around in. Is, is that Definitely. the only one that you've come across or is there other sort of cre- oh, the- yeah there's a million of them. Just, just to clarify, with Pantex, I've only seen it at this stage as a, as a watch band. I'm not too sure if, if you know, possible it's made with shoes and uh, and pants and whatnot. Um, but in terms of other ones, like the one I mentioned before, um, Econel, um, I thought was really cool. Or Econ, you know, however you want to say it. Another cool one's Reprieve, which is made from uh, recycled plastic bottles. Um, so that's really popular for, for activewear as well. Um, uh, it is... I'm really fascinated by the, the ability to regenerate fibers. So with those two that I just mentioned, um, I, I think they're, they're amazing, especially um, Econiol, because it, it essentially emulates virgin nylon, um, but without all the all the processing that goes into creating virgin nylon to start with. So um, they're probably my two favorite recycled ones, and their pin index probably my favorite um, sort of naturally derived one. It's interesting you brought up plastic bottles as well, because... Mm someone with a more sort of bigger thinking mind might go, well, yep. we clean up the oceans with plastic bottles and put that towards clothing that we can wear that's very sort of similar to what people are used yep. to wearing. So there's, there's mm-hmm. definite scope for almost killing two birds with one stone. Like you're sort of yeah. you up the, the oceans or whatever – place where plastic bottles tend to accumulate and you convert yep. the things that we can then we can then wear what happens to the material after that and uh, what i mean by that is using mm-hmm. the plastic bottles as an example when yep. we finish wearing our clothes and we finished so they're in the bin they're doing their whatever it is yeah it end up back in the oceans again so we're repeating this cycle, or are they completely like able to be broken down and then reused again? 
Um, well, you're talking about the recycle. Let's just say like a recycled jacket that's made from recycled plastic bottles. What happens to that jacket after that person's finished consuming that? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it seems like if, if you're replacing it, mm. if you're replacing something like cotton or nylon with, yeah. say, the to plastic bottles as, as an example, if it ends up back in the ocean anyway, yeah. you know, really, yeah, you're helping in terms of it's now no longer nylon or cotton, but the other problem of everything ending up in like waste disposals and all kinds of other places that doesn't yeah. solve does it if they end up in in the same place ultimately yeah i think it, just to, it brings up a great point i was chatting to one of my um the brands i've got on board and she was talking about how brands who are regenerating old materials in, into into new products she talked about how it's not the the best end solution so similar to what you're saying there in that it's not a it's not a way to you know make it more circular you're just recycling 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 like what what happens at the end so I think it's a really good point and what's really on the rise in the sustainable fashion industry, especially in swimwear, is what's essentially like a slow biodegradable fabric. So fabrics that you can, so they won't biodegrade while you're wearing them, you know, at the beach, which obviously would be um, horrible, but the ones that are, are made particularly so that when you do want to dispose of them, you can put them in your compost and they can be biodegradable. Now, I think that's a fantastic end solution. Um because at the end of the day, not everything that's recyclable is recycled. So it's all good and well putting, you know, your plastic bottles into the bin and, you know, wrappers in, into the uh, recycling bin. But unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's, the stats vary depending on what you read, but, you know, it's typically under 5 to 3% of products actually get recycled. So I think it's just a really important consideration just to reiterate that not everything that's recyclable gets recycled, hence end solutions um, are the ideal. So about this. Sorry, I'm about to sneeze, Michael. Oh. Okay, sorry, I'll be sorry. A few minutes break if you want, just to. No, oh. so, uh, so, uh, literally that's it. uh, it's going to come back any second now. Sorry, um, I think I finished my point anyway. It's all right. <laughs> sorry, mate. It's okay. I'll, uh, I always edit the shows anyway, so I'll just make them yeah. <laughs> a bit weird, really, oh, making really. the sneeze. But there we are. Okay. Um. So the yeah. Next question is okay. I know where I am. One of the yep. things that I did, I did find during my yep. vicious Googling, um, yep. there are materials out there that I've, I mean, it was a video. I don't know how, mm-hmm. um, how far down the production, apparently how far down the production line it is. Yep. I saw something that looks like plastic, but mm-hmm. then it dissolves in water. So once it touches water, it kind of evaporates, yeah. um, which I thought was very fast. Is it a cleaning solution? As, as long as it's not for like swimwear or, you know, something like that. <laughs> I, I imagine it being yeah. quite helpful, you know, because if it's a replacement for like plastic bottles or mm. something like that, it, it seems like it's quite helpful. So there's a lot of advancements mm. <clears throat> as far as what materials we can use. Yep. What sort of things do you do to keep up with like the recent trends and the yeah. changes that you're making? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. It's something I actually spoke about on my LinkedIn recently about your information diet. Uh, so I think it's really important to, to not be stagnant and you know read something five years ago and just believe that's the way it is moving forward. Um, especially being a big sort of business and marketing guru myself, you know, that's changing every, you know, every couple of weeks, um, you know, it's, it's, it's ever changing. So what I like to do is um, subscribe to some market leading newsletters. So there's some really cool ones based in Australia that I'd love to give a shout out to like Ethical Made Easy, uh, Eco Warrior Princess. Um, another really cool one is Ethically Kate. She's a New Zealand based um, sort of thought leader. Um, she's doing some really cool, actually a really cool TED talk. Um, Kate, her name's Kate Hall. So I think it's really important to subscribe to these newsletters and these influential people so you're getting fed this information into your inbox. So I do the same thing with my marketing as well. So I'm, I'm you know, a big SEO nerd, so I love to subscribe to newsletters like Ahrefs, um, Neil Patel, uh, Moz have a really good blog. So you, it, you don't have to rely on yourself to go out and actively search things. You, know, you don't have to you know, go onto Google News or, or go onto Twitter and search things and try to learn about it. 
sending fed straight into your inbox. So you kind of have no excuse not to read it. Um, just because I feel as though you know, we can miss these things if we're relying on ourselves to actually find it. Whereas if you're just subscribing to these newsletters, um, you know, it's getting fed right to you. And one thing I would say is don't go overboard and, and subscribe to 20 of them tonight um, because you're going to get pretty annoyed when they all start sending you their welcome series and your inbox is blocked for the next two weeks. So do it slowly, find the ones you'd like and um, yeah, really refine your information diet to keep leveling up your knowledge every single day. One of the one of the last things I really want to touch on is do you do a lot with with stride in terms of trying to change people's opinions of it? Because I know we touched on like the perception of it and yep. how to make it easier for people to actually incorporate more sustainable brands into their into their life. Yep. Do you have any, maybe it's like a top five tips or some parting words for us really as to yep. how we integrate this into our daily lives, whether it's access, yeah. whether it's, you know, the, I guess, lack of social pressure to mm. look a certain way, to yep. be treated as a certain way. What sort of yep. advice would you have for, for everybody? Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing I briefly touched upon earlier in our chat was to, to try to be better and not perfect. So when you are trying to make these changes and you know you might have just heard about sustainable fashion day or something you've heard about over the last couple of months, couple of years, it's not to feel as though that you need to throw out your entire wardrobe and only buy, you know, 100% organic materials tomorrow. I think it's really important to, to pause and reflect on, you know, what's in your wardrobe at the moment because there's nothing sustainable about throwing everything out and buying a whole new wardrobe tomorrow. So... And then moving forward as well, don't put pressure on yourself to, to always shop the perfect garment. So you, know, you might be with your friends and you might go past H&M who have a, a sketchy record in this regard and you might see something like, okay, that looks really cool. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've, you've been good for a while and you're like, look, I really want that T-shirt. I'm going to get that T-shirt. Um, you know, I, th I think it's like, you know, it's a similar thing with like junk food and all. I, th I think sometimes if you – you want it, you've got that craving, you even want that t-shirt, you know, it's not aligning with your values, not to, you know, be super, you know, hard on yourself and, and be perfect. Like you're allowed to slip up occasion, you know, similar things too with your sustainability efforts. Like, you know, a really big problem is like straws. Um, you know, when, when you go out, you know, you might go out for a few drinks with your friends and you, the bartender might give you a straw without you asking, like, you know, it's not something you want to do, but unfortunately like it's going to happen so just not to be put so much pressure on yourself to be perfect every single day you're going to have slip ups that would probably be the first one the second one i'd love to share about is just knowledge is power so like most things in life if you really want to sort of enforce change within yourself you really really justify those actions internally um because it's one thing for me or yourself michael or friends tell you okay it's really important for you to shop you know ethical sustainable brands but unless you appreciate the value behind that and why you should uh, make those changes you're probably not going to be doing it um, from a holistic approach so i've got a big belief in that there's a, a threshold of knowledge that most people go towards in the sustainable fashion niche in that once they learn a certain amount let's just say that 70 percent about the industry they feel compelled not to act how they used to in the past so you've really got to hit that threshold and just you know um you know researching stuff on you know google a really good documentary that's on netflix or it's on Netflix, depending on where you are. It's called the, the True Cost. I think it might be on Amazon Prime at the moment. That's a fascinating expose into the uh, fast fashion industry and just the devastating impact it has on you know people throughout Asia and throughout the world. And they talk about Rana Plaza. Um, they follow a, a Bangladeshi garment worker and, and detail her life and you know how she works her backside off um, to not even earn a living wage. So that's a really cool documentary to learn more. Um, and I think the third thing I'd like to share about is just probably detoxing yourself from the fast fashion brands on your social media feed. So whether it be on um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, whatever that may be, slowly starting to unfold those brands who are pressuring you into having to buy that dress for that next birthday party or or putting onto you these really impossible beauty standards that you have to live towards and, and telling you that you need to buy this, you know, this new jacket to be cool um because at the end of the day you know your shopping consumption needs to be intrinsic so if these you know brands and influencers for that matter are you know pressuring you to act in a way that's probably not 100 percent new um to, to stop following and stop engaging with their content because 
it's making you into a person that you don't want to be and, and it's a person that I don't want you to become. So um, that'd probably be my, my top three. Well, Jordan, I think that is a fantastic way to end. Thanks for for giving up the, the time to be on the show. I appreciate my it. My pleasure. Look forward to keeping in touch. Uh, thanks, Michael.